Good morning, Church of the Front Range. How are we doing today? It's really good to be together. Can I invite you to stand all over this room as we worship the Lord? He is worthy of our worship. He's worthy of our praise. Oh, the weight of His glory. It's higher than the others 
teach you guys a new song this morning. The king is in the room. Come see the scars of love upon his head. The healers in the 
standing in the center of the throne. And skipping down to verse 9, they sang a new song. The saints sang a new song. It says, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And you were purchased. With your blood, you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. With your blood, you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. And then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000 and they they encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders and in a loud voice they sang worthy is the lamb who was slain worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise worthy is the lamb slain. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Jesus, we worship you. You are worthy of it all. Only you. There is no other name. There is no one else. Only you. We praise you, Jesus. Oh, would you sing with me? Would you lift your voice to the church? You are worthy of it all.
God, can we thank him now, church? Jesus, we praise you today. We thank you today. We thank him for your salvation. Thank him for saving you if he's rescued you. Some of y'all in this room, if he set you free from something, would you thank him now? Take a moment, thank him. You're so good, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray and the church said, amen, amen. It's good to be with you guys this morning. Hey, would you take a moment and meet a few people around you and you can find a seat. Church of the Front Range. Happy fall. You guys liking this change in weather? Yeah, I, I, we've got some plaids coming out. It's, it's time to leave that portion of the summer wardrobe behind, if you ask me. So I do have a couple announcements before we jump into our time of teaching. Uh, first, uh, regarding the Church of the Front Range board, we are excited uh, to be in the process of adding a new member uh, to the board. So at this point, uh, the current board has had a chance to interview a number of candidates uh, and has prayerfully selected Lori Wagner uh, to come and to join the board. Uh, a number of you know Lori. Lori's wife to Todd, mom to three uh, children, Taylor, Logan, and River. Uh, their entire family has called Church of the Front Range their church home since its inception, and they're certainly on fire for the mission, personally living out the vision of all, all. Uh, Lori serves faithfully in our church in a number of capacities. She's uh, very passionate about prayer. She serves both with intercessory and post-service prayer. Uh, she is a small group leader in students of the front range with sixth and seventh grade girls, as well as a small group leader for the 30s and 40s women's small group that meets on Wednesday nights. Uh, also, as needed, she serves with the Inspiring Spaces team. Uh, prior to being called to be a stay-at-home mom, Lori worked professionally as a marketing and administration director for uh, Todd, her husband's law firm. She has a background in marketing and events as an independent contractor. Uh, she longs for the advancement of God's kingdom through the pursuit of revival. Uh, as a member of the board, I feel confident in saying she will be devoted to seeking the Lord on the directions and decisions and the matters uh, that would help uh, further his advancement and his vision for Church of the Front Range. We did include Lori's biography in this last week's email if you'd like to check it out. Uh, and if any congregant has any material concerns about her serving in this capacity, uh, not that we foresee any, but it is a standard uh, part of our process, then please let us know by October 24th. Uh, otherwise, hold your peace, okay? So you got till October 24th. Uh, she will be officially installed after that. Uh, with her first term officially commencing in February of this coming year. Uh, so thank you for listening to that. Second, as many of you know, uh, one of our external ministry partners is A21, founded by Christine and Nick Kane, uh, friends of this house, a ministry that exists to abolish uh, modern-day slavery. So around the world today, there are 40.3 million people enslaved. It's more, there are more people enslaved today than at any other point in human history. Human trafficking generates an average of $150 billion per year, and it's not just a problem somewhere, it is a problem uh, here as well. By every measure, Denver ranks consistently in the top 10 of America's uh, most trafficked cities. And so Church of the Front Range has stepped forward to host a Walk for Freedom uh, right here in Lone Tree, where we're going to be participating in bringing awareness to uh, this tragedy. So on October 15th, please pencil it into your calendars. October 15th from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. is when this is going to be happening. So Walk for Freedom, it's a global awareness event uh, rallying tens of thousands of people, uh, taking millions of steps in hundreds of cities all over the world. So we're going to be participating uh, in that. So if you'd like to participate in the event, you can go to our website, churchofthefrontrange.com forward slash A21. You can click to either register or to give. Uh, from there, we're also going to have people in the lobby right after service who can give you more information if you'd like to ask more information about how to sign up for that. Final announcement, if you're new here 
and you would like to learn more about our church, uh, how you would get connected, how you would get involved, maybe you're kind of kicking the tires of Church of the Front Range, we have a short meeting right after this service uh, that's designed just for you. It's going to be up in the New Here room, which is on the left side of the lobby as you're exiting and making your way toward the main exit doors. Just grab your kids after service. You can take them with you, uh, and you'll get a chance to hear and meet a number of our pastors up there at that time. So I do hope you can swing by. Uh, now we're going to jump back into our weekend teaching series. So welcome back to Titans and Tidal Waves. This is actually going to be the final week of Titans and Tidal Waves, a series we began at the beginning of this past summer. And today we're going to be addressing just one more. And essentially it's the accusation that patriarchy and the oppression of women is the fault of Christianity. Is that true? Is that true? So as we wade into this subject, it's good for us to be aware of something. And it's that the students are very excited about what's happening on the other side of that wall. Uh, no, it's this. Uh, the ratios of men and women at church have been changing in recent years. Uh, you might still kind of have in your mind that there's way more women than men at churches in America, but that is no longer true. It's now down to a one-to-one -one ratio of men and women. And unfortunately, it's not by men catching up in terms of their engagement with the things of faith. It's because women's rates of engagement and attendance has plummeted even faster than men's. So in 2009, 48% of women attended church at least once a week. In less than a decade, that share has dropped all the way down to 31%. So there is something remarkable that's happening in the data right now across America. The question is, why is that happening? I've been reading the research and just from reading it and uh, synthesizing what I see as the leading contributors, here's what I'm going to suggest to you in rapid fire fashion, are the top five reasons that this decline of women's attendance at church has happened. First of all, the church has been in this counter feminist swing. And in this counter-feminist swing, the church has become almost overtly oppressive and misogynistic uh, in many churches and in many circles. So how did that happen? Think about it. A generation ago, we had nearly a two-to-one ratio of women to men in the church. And everybody knew it. It's like we had a man problem. You know, like men just didn't want to be at church and they didn't want to be engaged with the things of faith. Many women felt this and they expressed it like, why won't my husband come? Why won't my sons come? All the single ladies were like, why, why won't the single men come and, uh, to be more spiritually engaged? And so in various ways, the churches started to recognize, oh, we have a problem. And they started to emphasize um, the men more. And so women uh, were often thrilled about this because, you know, Men were getting the attention, and they knew that the men needed the attention. They needed to be the focus of attention uh, because they were just tired of coming without the men in their lives coming with them. And so now here we are. The ratio is narrowed uh, one to one, and you can still go to many churches where there's just so much emphasis on the men, right? It's just men and men and men and men, and like the women aren't even being mentioned at the churches. It's, it's kind of odd. I mean, if it was reversed and you had like a woman pastor, it was just women, 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 and like the men weren't being mentioned, they weren't, like you would imagine she must be like an Amazonian warrior or something, you know, like, uh, but this is what's happening today. And it's kind of odd. It's unnerving. Uh, frankly, I'm going to tell you something is off in the American church with this. Uh, that's the first reason. Anyway, this counter feminist swing. A second reason we're seeing such a steep decline of women in the church it's just very practically, women have gotten a lot more involved in providing financially for the family. And so now they're doing, you know, more with the same amount of time. It's what's happening. So like their margin is just less. The, the amount of energy that they have is less. Uh, they don't have as much time, as much capacity to focus on spiritual things. I think that if you asked most women today if they feel maxed, they would say no. No, we're way beyond maxed. Max was a long time ago. We're so far past that point. Are you kidding me? And that's just a practical reason I think that we are seeing this decline. A third reason for this decline, the church has done a really poor job with describing gender norms. As if a Christian perspective of a woman is uh, a wife, a mom that's good at cleaning and laundry, is able to host good parties, and somebody who stays smoking hot for her husband, and well, that's about it. 
Like that, that's, that's our gender norm that's been put out there. And so if you're not that and you're not seeking to be that, well, how much do you want to go to a church where that is the ideal that is perpetuated week after week, week in and week out? Fourth reason for this decline, the sexual abuse and the misuse of power stuff in the church. It's a major contributor. That's heartbreaking, but it's true. Fifth Women want to make a difference, too. All too often, they've not felt that they have a meaningful place to contribute uh, when they come to church. So I just want you to put yourself in the shoes of, like, many of today's uh, women. So let's just say Jane's just going to, you know, um, describe many of today's women. She, she leads, you know, the marketing department for a company. She's a mom of three from late elementary uh, to early high school. From, so, you know, from the time she wakes up until she, like, puts her head on the pillow, it is just sprint. It's just go, go, go. The kids up, ready to school, off to work, got to get home for all the kids' activities at night. You know, you got the house, you got dinner, you, you name it. And so very practically, if you have uh, someone like Jane that's living that life, and let's just say they're not like you know, the most versed in scripture. I mean, spirituality is important to them, but it's not, it's not like they're super deep in scripture. So they don't know some things. They don't know the significance of the gathering, but they consider themselves a Christian. Uh, and yet they've got this picture of, of going to church where they just don't really fit in with the stereotypical picture of women that is presented at church. On top of that, there's not a lot of serving opportunities for them. I mean, yes, there's this opportunity to, to make kids crafts, and that's not insignificant. It is important. It's just that they don't like doing crafts in any context and, and aren't very good at it either. And so Jane, you know, she's just looking at this, and she's thinking, well, I could stay at home. You know, I could maybe watch online, catch a podcast here or there. The church isn't really missing anything if I'm gone, and, and she doesn't really feel like she's missing anything if she's not there either. That right there, I think, is a pretty accurate picture of many women today. And now you sprinkle on top of that just enough of the misogynistic language and just enough of the stories of the misuse of power and just enough of those clips of, of women that are being spoken of in a degrading manner by pastors. And now what do you get? It's game, set, match. And we are where we are today. Really, we might say, well, Jane, come on. I mean, maybe those things are true, but don't you know? The Bible says not to neglect the gathering. Don't you know that the word church it literally means gathering? That this is the assembly of the living stones, the temple of the New Testament, where God is uniquely present and all of that. And, you know, shouldn't you be here? Well, Jane thinks she's fine because somewhere along the way, she, she heard that it's not about religion and it's not about an institution. It's about a personal relationship. And so she's, she's like, I've got that. This is where we are today. How many Janes do you think are out there? There's a lot, probably more than we can imagine. And yet throughout all this thread of understanding some of the contributors of how women's attendance and engagement in church has outpaced the drop off of men's to the point where at the point we're at today, well, don't forget our battle is against principalities and powers. How many of you guys had mothers that, that prayed for you and that discipled you and that were instrumental in the faith that you have today? It's not uncommon to see that there's like a lot of Eunices out there raising Timothys to reference the New Testament. I mean, they're raising them up in this sincere faith. The enemy's been watching this. He, he's been seeing these spiritual mothers and... Uh, the, the way they have been coming against his point and his purposes. He's seen all this history of the mother praying for her children, reading the, uh, you know, Bible stories to her children, taking her children to church, often really being the spiritual leader in the home when the husband uh, wasn't. And that's never been insignificant. That's never been irrelevant. He sees it. He knows what it is. He sees that the seeds of God's words are, have been primarily watered by the prayers of these mothers. And it's produced many strong saints who he doesn't like very much. And so he's seen this and he knows that if he could take the moms out, then the whole family can crumble. She's the watchman at the front door of the spiritual house of many families. So just take note of this. Uh, he, he's seen this and what's he doing? Well, <clears throat> excuse me. Anytime the church takes note of a problem, okay, well, the enemy is smart enough to go, oh, they're going to correct this problem that I have been maximizing the opportunity of. 
What's he going to do? He's going to try to grab that pendulum, and he doesn't want it to stop here, does he? He's like, okay, you're going to fix the problem. Whee! And he's going to help push that thing as far in the other direction as possible. So if here was where we're supposed to be, we actually end up not with, it's a, it's a net net at best, or at worst for him, or maybe even a greater problem than what you had before. He decided to recognize it and fix it. This is the way he works. As soon as you recognize a problem in your life and you're going to solve it, he's going to grab that pendulum. He's going to try to do the same thing. So he sees this, and it, it's a big deal. I mean, this isn't just impactful in the women of today. Uh, this is a targeted attack that, if successful, and uh, it's looking pretty successful right now, it will have impact on many generations to come. The next generation, the generation after that, the generation after that. This is a very significant thing. We just can't afford to be silent on this. If I'm honest, I've been around you know, the church long enough to tell you that there are many men in the church, there are many in leadership in churches who would hear all of this, and frankly, they just couldn't care the least. It's like, yawn. Why should I care about that? Except maybe the impact on their kids, they might care about that. In those cases where there is such apathy about women, I believe that with all of my heart, that it, sadly it's because there is actual misogyny. There is actual animosity towards women that exists behind thinly veiled veneers of biblical conviction among so many pastors and parishioners. And finally, before we jump in, for the young people or the parents of young people, no one's going to go to college today and fail to hear that the church is about power-hungry men invested in their own interests who will oppress anyone that they perceive to be a threat to them. And, of course, they're going to throw a lot of people into that bucket, but women will be among them. And so let's just address this. And as, as always, we've got to go back to, like, well, what actually does the Bible say? Let's start there because all of this isn't fully a new topic. It has taken on a new label. And that new label it has a more targeted attack on scripture than the labels before. Like you used to hear about sexism and chauvinism. Today you're going to hear about patriarchy. And so patriarchy is this broad category of all things that have caused and, and would continue to cause the suppression and the oppression of women, uh, keeping the balances of power and privilege in the hands of men. And so our question today, if you're taking notes, is this, is Judaism, and by extension, Christianity, responsible for the systematic and sustained oppression of women? That's our question that we're going to be building a lot of this off of. It's not hard to find those that claim that it is. In fact, it's pretty easy. Here's one quote uh, from Christians for Social Action. Uh, quote, American Christianity has been a horrible place for women. It ignores them, abuses them, assaults them, objectifies them, oppresses them, and then attempts to theologically rationalize it all as being biblical and holy. The church has been a willing co-conspirator in the widespread affliction of women. Christianity has a history of manipulating the Bible to reinforce patriarchy in which men are seen to be spiritual leaders and women are to submit to their authority. This has resulted in the smothering of women's gifts of pastoral leadership and ministry. Women are intentionally excluded from roles of authority and their truth, wisdom, and experiences have been unfairly dismissed. End quote. I'll share with you another. Quote, how did the church come to discourage women from leadership? Historically, Latin patriarchy was mediated and perpetuated through Christianity and its presence in Christianity has been conserved Furthermore, parts of the Bible have mediated patriarchal submission and proclaimed God and Christ in patriarchal terms. This patriarchy has defined Christianity and Christian practices throughout Christian history. The Aristotelian biblical construct of the inferior human nature of slaves and freeborn women has been woven into the fabric of Christian theology. This framework has long prevented women from holding positions of governance in our churches, continuing to keep women subordinated in many Christian denominations. Patriarchy and the false notions of a nobility of suffering allows abuse toward women to occur, not only in our churches, but within our homes and places of work, end quote. So anyways, you're getting a, a pretty you know, fair flavor of what's being uh, spoken these days, but is it true? Is it true? And most importantly, uh, does the Bible itself promote this? Now, some will say, especially at colleges, yes, the Bible promotes this. After all, 1 Corinthians 14, 34 says, women should remain silent in the churches. They're not allowed to speak, but must be in submission, as the law says. 
So many will read this and they'll say, that's pretty black and white. Case closed. Or 1 Timothy 2.12, I do not allow a woman to teach or to exercise authority over man, but to remain quiet. Well, it seems like you got a simple equation. One plus one equals two. The Bible is oppressive to women. But is it? Or is there a context that we are clueless about? Let's not miss this. What did we just read in those verses? We just read in those two verses that women can't talk at church. They cannot exercise authority over a man. They must remain quiet at church and they cannot teach. Now, interestingly, those that, that love their, these verses for their complementarian uh, at church position only actually obey one of the four of those. Just, you know, that women shouldn't teach. The other three they're cool with, but just one of the four. So it seems to me that when you look at this, the Bible might actually promote the suppression of women, or it seems to many. And if these verses are timelessly true, if they are prescribed mandates, then it would actually turn out that the New Testament would be far more subjugating of women than the Old Testament ever was. Do I have your attention? Now, we've taught on this subject in greater detail. Uh, we did two full weekends on this subject in our We Believe series. Uh, if you have not heard those two teachings on women in the Bible, they're available. You can go to our website and go to our YouTube in the We Believe series, uh, and you can check them out. We're not going to be repeating all of that uh, for today. But for now, there's two basic positions about male and uh, female relationships. There is the egalitarian and there is the complementarian position. Egalitarian, by definition, it means equal. Uh, the egalitarian position would state that men and women are equal. There, there's, uh, neither has any authority over the other uh, by nature of their sex, either in marriage or at church or in society. On the other end of the spectrum is the complementarian position, uh, which holds that men and women are equal ontologically, but that wives are to be submissive to their husbands at home. And that women are also to be in submission to men at church, which means that they are prohibited from various positions of spiritual authority and influence at church, including, usually at minimum, uh, teaching men or being an elder. So, as we've taught before, we hold to a modified position here. Uh, we believe that the biblical teaching um, is a complementarian position in marriage. Um, but we do believe that it's egalitarian in every other place, uh, in both church and in society. The New Testament translations blur the ability to see this because uh, the Greek word um, for woman or wife is the same exact word. You have to have the context to know whether to translate it as wife uh, or woman. And so there are times when wives were doing things that in that society were seen as very disrespectful and dishonoring, uh, degrading even to their husbands, uh, which was certainly wrong, uh, but it was culturally conditioned. Um, and the translators are translating those passages as women should not, not wives should not. If this was understood, the lack of congruence between passages where we read that women are prophets and led the nation of Israel and serve as deacons and apostles in the New Testament church and prayed publicly and other passages like those alongside these passages which seem to prohibit those things, if this was understood, that lack of congruence, it would be rectified. The Bible is not contradictory of itself, but when you hold either one of those two positions fully, you truly can't reconcile it. So we have this modified position. We see the Bible teaches headship and marriage. It's a part of creation design. Uh, we do agree with the complementarian position there, although not necessarily uh, some of the ways people perceive it, but yet you get the idea. Uh, we also um, do not agree with it applied outside of marriage. So in short, when you look at the situation, uh, we make almost nobody happy as usual, uh, not fully agreeing with anyone, but go figure. Uh, it is worth saying there are uh, those egalitarians who have a genuine biblical conviction about this. And there are those complementarians who have a genuine biblical conviction about their views as well. And there are smart peoples on both sides of this spectrum. There are godly people on both sides of this spectrum. There are people who are seeking to be submitted and be faithful to Scripture on both sides of this spectrum. However, there are those that go beyond either side of the spectrum as well if you have the discernment to detect it. There are some who have something more than biblical, genuine biblical conviction that are driving them in one of these two directions. How do you know that? What are some signs that it's going beyond just actual biblical principles for a person? The first is degrading language. 
When you spot language that is degrading to men or women, you can be sure this has gone beyond genuine biblical theological conviction. Second, pay attention when there's not opportunities to serve with certain spiritual graces. Even if, if, if someone is complementarian in the typical complementarian sense, like, well, okay, they don't believe that women can, can teach men, so is there a women's ministry? Is there a place where women who are graced to teach have an opportunity uh, to teach? Like, is there a place for that grace to function? If, if there isn't, that is certainly a sign that something is not right. There are more than those two, but those are two good ones to pay attention to. So what does the Bible actually say? Let's just go there. What does the Bible actually say about this? Does the Bible set up uh, the situation as some describe it? First of all, God made both male and female in his image. That's Genesis 1.27. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. If you're taking notes, that is point one about what the Bible says. Both male and female are made in his image. That's what God's word says. There is no such thing as a partial image bearer. I hate saying it, but there are so many churches that if you went and you just, you know, went up on stage and you, you grabbed the mic and you said, well, all those made in the image of God, please stand up. You'd have many men and you would have some women stand up. That's a shame. The truth is both male and female are made in his image. There is no partial image bearer. Second, God's original commission in the garden to rule over and subdue and exercise dominion over the earth that wasn't just given to Adam, it was given to both. Then God said, let us make men in our image according to our likeness. Let them rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Verse 28, God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. This commission to exercise rule and to bring creation under under dominion. It was not to one, it was to both. So for your notes, that's number two. The commission to subdue and to rule uh, the earth was to both male and female. So any theology that's neglecting that right, uh, it's going against the very pre-fall commission of the Lord given to Adam and Eve. Third, a lot of what we see today that perpetuates the oppression of women, it's not a part of God's original design. It's part of the fall. There are sometimes morally neutral dynamics that end up leading to morally non-neutral dynamics. The soci sociological theories out there on this stuff right now, in my view, they're, they're trash. Uh, so I think it's good to understand this, okay? There are results of the fall that are not God's design, results which, in a morally neutral or even a morally positive way, led to men being outside the home and women being inside the home. But through Sin becomes systems of suppression and power imbalance between men and women. So just track with me for a moment. Before the fall, there was no threat. So there was no threat of your wife or your daughters being harmed or being violated by others. Eve walked around. She didn't have to have mace with her, big can of bear spray. There was none of that. You know, like she, she just walked around without a care. But since the fall, the world has been a place of danger for women in a unique way. It's a result of the fall. That wasn't part of God's design. So, on top of that, add war. War is not a part of God's design. But now you've got war. So who is typically and naturally going to get selected to go around and, and, and swing heavy metal swords at each other while wearing armor? It's probably going to be those that are physically stronger that would naturally be selected to go out to battle, the men. And so the women are at home with the kids, Men are off at battles. This is morally neutral. It's not making a statement of greater or lesser worth in terms of men and women, of who's outside the home and inside the home. But again, even this you know, morally neutral dynamic, it is a result of the fall. And it's the same with work, with labor and provision. Before the fall, God had planted the Garden of Eden. Now it's by the sweat of your brow that you're going to have to farm the land. Remember, hunting and farming were the two primary means of providing for your family. So who's naturally going to get selected to be sent out of the house to go up and out and break up the soil and dig the ditches and plant the seeds and hunt the wild animals? Again, it may not be the smartest uh, of the two in the couple, but it's going to be the brawniest one that's going to get that job. Now, these are all impacts of the fall, threat, war, and work. 
at least hard work, but morally neutral choices in front of people, that all three, they naturally tilt in the direction of sending the man out of the house while the domestic care remaining in, in you know, the woman's domain. It's just, it's a morally neutral decision, but it tilts in that direction. So to be honest, on top of that, whenever you combine the threat of danger, right, the husband wants to keep his wife and his kids in his home to protect them. It's even a morally positive, potentially, at first, decision. But even an originally, potentially moral positive can become a system that puts women systemically out of the power position. Are you tracking? How does this happen? So in a world with limited resources, the power dynamics shift to the one who makes the money. That's just the way things work. In a world with limited resources, the power dynamic, it does shift to the one who makes the money. And so those dynamics of men being the one, ones going out while women are staying at home, it does sis, systemically and systematically put men in a position of power. But God didn't design it that way from the beginning. In response to sin and threat, we want to be safe, right? We want to keep ourselves and we want to keep our loved ones safe. But over time, that intention to keep safe, it can turn into suppression. If it gets twisted and distorted into the woman's places at home, whenever it's no longer, hey, let's do what makes the most sense for our family's safety and for our family's provision. And instead, it's you're a woman, that's your place. Even suggesting God put women in that place. Now you get the idea how something morally neutral, potentially even morally positive at first, can be turned into a system of suppression. Sin jumps on this, and it twists it, and it turns it from what it was intended to keep safe and provide to what is now purposed to suppress in many cases. So what was pragmatic for just living where you live and needing to provide for the family can become something oppressive under sin's influence. So for your notes, if you're taking notes, and this is a compound sentence. Point number three about what the Bible actually says is this. Neither the pragmatism that put men outside of the home and women in the home, nor the imbalance of power that those patterns create are part of God's design. But they are byproducts of the fall. Just because you read of something as uh, normative in a fallen world doesn't mean it was prescribed. Just because something's described in Scripture doesn't mean it was prescribed in Scripture. So back to our main question. Is Judaism, and by extension Christianity, responsible for the systematic and sustained oppression of women? Let's getting back to what the Bible says and does the Bible call for it. The fourth point is this. The gender norms of the Bible are grossly misrepresented in the church today. So let's just peruse quickly those women in the scriptures the Bible takes special mention of, highlights, takes note of. And let's just see what actually are the gender norms described in the Bible. So Miriam, if you're doing our Bible in one year uh, with us right now, um, we just read about her this last week. She's mentioned as the one who puts Moses in the basket, uh, which saves the life of the one who is going to be God's chosen deliverer of the nation. Later she joins him. She's a prophetess, played a part in the exodus of Israel out of Egypt and the foundation of Israel. So there's Miriam, uh, Deborah, certainly. She was a judge, uh, which was a warrior leader of Israel before they started to have kings. Uh, and God raised up Deborah to deliver Israel from their enemies. Now, some will say, well, God only raised up Deborah because there was no man available to be found. Listen, God never violates his moral laws for the sake of pragmatism. You need to remember that. God never violates his own moral laws for the sake of pragmatism. It's why it's a horrible argument that God raised up Deborah because there was no dude. Come on. Ruth, the Moabite woman who preserved the line of Boaz from which Jesse was born and then David was born and then eventually Jesus. Rahab, she saved the spies. Esther saved Israel from extinction in Persia. Shifra and Pua, again, we just read about them last week. Uh, not many have named their daughters Pua, but uh, it was cool back then. Uh, but they were the Hebrew midwives in Egypt 
who defied Pharaoh and continued to deliver the sons of Israel, again, functioning as deliverers of an entire generation, risking their lives to do so. Or Hannah, she seeks the Lord for a son. Uh, the Lord gives her Samuel. She devotes her son to the Lord. He becomes the greatest judge of Israel to date and the last judge and the only prophet and judge combo at the same time other than Deborah. Again, delivering Israel. Huldah, prophetess. Man, when Josiah and the priests, they found the book of the law and they, and they heard the things that God had revealed in Scripture, which they had lost track of. Josiah said, go and inquire of the Lord for me what we should do. Do you remember who they went to to inquire of the Lord? They went to Huldah, the prophetess. She's the one that gave the prophecy that led to the reformation of Israel under Josiah and saved a generation and extended the judgment into exile into the next Abigail spared David from bringing judgment on himself. Uh, Zipporah, again, fresh reading from last week, atoned for Moses' sins uh, in failing to circumcise his own sons. Uh, not only did she correct Moses for raising his sons as if they were Egyptians in that process, but she saved Moses' life in the process. Jael in the Old Testament delivered Israel from King Jabin of Canaan. And I mean, we can go on and on and on. It's to say nothing of Elizabeth, Mary, Mary Magdalene, Anna, the prophetess who prayed continually in the temple, Phoebe, the leader of the church in Rome, Priscilla, who taught Apollos, Junia, an apostle, with the many women mentioned in Luke 8 who funded Jesus' ministry, including Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Susanna, many others, reminiscent of the Shunammite woman who provided for and helped fund Elisha's ministry. I mean, when you actually go through the women whose acts are commended and noted in Scripture, you will see a gender norm of provision, leadership, and deliverance. Not exactly what's being stereotyped in the churches today. So where do we get this stereotype of what a Christian woman is? Where does it come from? Does it come from Proverbs 31, the Proverbs 31 woman, as so many think? So many reference, if you've been around church for a long time, you know about the P31 woman, right? She's a big deal. So many reference the P31 woman as if she was the first bikini wearing, cookie baking, home party making, say nothing, but smiling always version of a submissive helpmeet that has brought about the stereotype of what a Christian woman is supposed to be. But would the Proverbs 31 woman agree with you? I'm making some of the dudes mad, I can tell. Let's just go to Proverbs 31 and see if that's what the Bible upholds as the gender norm of a woman who is married. Proverbs 31.10, an excellent wife who can find her worth is far above jewels. And just for starters, this word excellent, it says excellent wife. It's a very interesting translation by the New American Standard Bible here. The primary translation of this word by the NASB itself in other places is army, valor or valiant, or wealth. This word in the Hebrew, it's, it's always used of the valiant mighty men. You know, the, the warriors in Scripture, the strong ones in Scripture. In a financial context, it means wealth or riches. Um, but I actually took the liberty to, to look up all 200 plus times that this word is found in the Hebrew Old Testament. There is another place that the NASB chose to um, translate it as excellent. I only found one other place of the 200 plus times, but they did translate it excellent another time. You want to see that time? Proverbs 12.4. An excellent wife is the crown of her husband. Now, gang, I primarily, this, this is NASB right here, okay? I primarily use the 1995 NASB translation. Sometimes you guys ask me that. That's what I primarily use. And I primarily use it because I, I find it's the best out there to the original languages in most cases. Uh, but to say that there is not a bias against women in this translation, it would be a lie. The only two times you translate the word for valiant or strong as excellent are the two times it precedes the word wife. Wow. That's bold. Church, this verse is describing a valiant wife. Remember what God said of Eve, that she was made to be a helper, and that word helper is only used in a positive sense in the Old Testament about God himself other than of Eve. And it was always, almost always, used in the context of war or battle, that God is our helper. 
So Eve is made to be this side-by-side -side warrior. It's not accidental. It's also a war word that is used first of the Proverbs 31 woman. She's a side-by-side -side warrior wife. A valiant, strong helper. Let's continue on. Verse 11 and 12. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. So what's going to top the list of what God says a man should be searching for and seeking to find in his wife? It's a trustworthy heart. Now, is that any surprise given what we know about God who does the same? First Samuel 16, 7. The Lord said to Samuel, don't look on his appearance or the height of his stature because I have rejected him. The Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So the Proverbs 31 woman, first thing we read about is her heart. But there's a lot more. Verse 13, she looks for wool and flax and works with her hands in delight. She's like merchant ships. She brings her food from afar. She rises also while it is still night and gives food to her household and portions to her maidens. Later in the chapter we read in verse 24, she makes linen garments and sells them and supplies belts to the tradesmen. I mean, this isn't a picture of passivity. This isn't a picture of Idleness, this is a picture of an industrious woman, one who is providing not only for herself, but for others. She's just not, and notice she's not just sitting there at the table, dependent on her hubby to bring her the supplies that she needs so that she can, you know, do the assembly line thing and then he can like, you know, take the products off the market. She's doing A to Z. She goes and gets the supplies, she manufactures, and then she sells them. I mean, whoever said that a woman's place is in the home, meaning that her place must only be in the home as though that's the only option she has. They have not read the scriptures. Continuing on in verse 16, she considers a field and she buys it from her earnings. She plants a vineyard. This is a businesswoman being described here in Proverbs 31, and a dang good one. She's discerning. She's wise. It doesn't say she considers the field and makes a recommendation to her husband. Like she's in the lead role in this very significant transaction. I hope that you're seeing, church, that there's so many stereotypes. There's even so many gender norms that are being presented as biblical when they are not. And there's so many stereotypes and even so many norms that are presented as, as what biblical submission in marriage means, which are not. Many times people portray headship as the man making all the financial decisions. But is that what we're seeing here? No, we're seeing a team that's leaning into the strengths of those that are on the team. That's what we see. So if you've got someone on the team that's good with numbers, an accountant, whatever, wouldn't you want that person probably to be the lead in, in the finances in your marriage, regardless of their gender? Better together, stronger together. That's the biblical model. That's God's design. You can't do that if you sideline one person and only benefit from one person's strengths. Verse 17. She girds herself with strength and makes her arms strong. I mean, this is a strong, active woman, literally, so much so, even her arms are strong. This isn't a woman sitting around being primped and pampered all day. She's a woman with purpose and with contribution, and she is strengthened, and she is strengthening herself for it. What else? Verse 20, she extends her hands to the poor. She stretches out her hands to the needy. She's generous. She's a vessel of God's grace and a vessel of God's good. Verse 25, strength and dignity are her clothing, and she smiles at the future. Don't you love that? This is a woman who's strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. She's not an anxious woman that's frightful and fretful about tomorrow. She is clothed in honor. She is clothed in strength. And pay attention to that. She's not clothed as eye candy. She's clothed in honor and strength. That word honor is usually translated as majesty. She's clothed in majesty. Can we just teach our kids to do the same? Amen. Amen. We do not need our daughters thinking they exist to dress up as somebody else's eye candy. Yeah. We've got a lot of Hollywood and Kardashian influence in this place where we live, and it's not good. It's not good at all. What else? Verse 26, she opens her mouth in wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. Verse 30, charms deceitful, beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. So at the center of it all is this woman who fears the Lord. She's steadfast in seeking him. She is steadfast in his strength. She sees what he sees. She says what he says. She is a vessel of his great grace in so many ways. So how does what we just read compare to the often portrayed Proverbs 31 poster child, which is, you know, good looks and skilled homemaking and not much else. There's nothing wrong with those things, by the way. There isn't. 
But it's problematic to say that that's what God is calling women to be, and that's what a Proverbs 31 woman is. So if you press me, does the Bible portray gender norms? Yeah, it does. And what are those norms for women? Well, we've been seeing a God-fearing, strong, hardworking, business-savvy, smart, wise, educated gender who's often highlighted for their role in provision and leadership and in the deliverance of God's people. Yeah, there's gender norms in the Bible. Amen. May our daughters know all that God wants to do with them. Can women serve at the home? Of course. But the point is, we're not to be running around saying women's only place is in the home. A woman's place is in the home if God calls them to be in the home. A man's place might be in the home if God calls him to be at the home. You get the idea. In response, I'm going to invite us to bow our heads and close our eyes. And this is just a chance for us to prayerfully reflect and respond. You know, the word of God says that the one who uh, hears the word and walks away and, and forgets what he read doesn't do anything with it is completely not what we want to be. We want to be those who apply the word of God. Would you come to him? Would you ask, believer, Lord, is there, are there any changes that you want me to make in light of what we read from your word? God, have I confused cultural norms for biblical mandates? God, am I honoring you in how I treat and how I relate to others? Men, would you ask, am I following Jesus' model not leveraging power or position for self-promotion or for gain, but for sacrificial service. Women, would you ask, have I accepted a burden or some definition that's something other than, than what you say? Ask him, God, have I sought you? Am I continuing to seek you for how you're calling me to serve in every sphere of life, home, church, work, whatever you call me to? And also something for parents, God, just ask him, God, is there anything I need to do differently in my parenting to help my kids, my sons and my daughters understand who you've created them to be, what you've called them to do? And believer, as you are praying on that, I also want to speak to those of you who are here and you might say, hey, I'm kind of exploring the Christian faith. Maybe you used to go to church, but you've been coming back recently but you just feel like you lack confidence of where you stand with God. I want to share the good news with you that you can walk out of this room confident where you stand with him, being united in a relationship with him, even confident that you will be united in that relationship and with him for all of eternity. You see, the Bible actually says that all of us, we were made for a relationship with God. That's what we were made for. In fact, every good and perfect gift comes from him. He's the source of all love, of all life, of all purpose, of all fulfillment. Everything that we were made for is meant to be found in him. But the Bible also tells us that our sin, it separates us from God because he's holy. And so you end up with a world where people are running around, they're trying to find what we were made to find in God from this person, that person, this thing, that thing. And it never satisfies, no matter how much you get of it, it will never fill you up because you were made for God. You have others that are like, you know, I, I recognize that, you know, I've done some bad things, but I'm just gonna try to be a good person and hope that that kind of works out in eternity. Listen, the Bible's very clear with us that doesn't work out in eternity. We need to be holy as he is holy to be in a relationship with that's not something you and I can do for ourselves. No one is sinless. That's why God made a way doing for us what we could not do for ourselves so that we could be completely forgiven of our sin, have our sins completely removed so we could be reconciled into a relationship with a sinless, perfect, holy God, both in this life and forever after. How did God do that? He did that by sending Jesus Christ, his one and only eternally begotten son, who himself, being God, came and died on the cross for you and for me. He took the consequence of our sin. See, all sin leads to death, which is separation from God who is life. He took the consequence of sin in our place, and yet he rose from the grave promising that you will not die in your sin, but you will live and live forever if you receive him and what he's done for you. 
See, this isn't something you can earn. It's something that you can receive as a gift. And the way the Bible tells us to do that is by putting our faith in Jesus Christ for who he is and what he's done as Lord and as Savior. If you're here and you don't have that confidence that you're in relationship with God and that you're going to spend eternity with him, if you've never put your faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, I want to give you an opportunity to do that before you go. With heads bowed and eyes closed, if that's you and you want to receive him today, would you just raise your hand? As your way of saying, I'm hearing that God has reached his hand down to make a way for me to be forgiven and me to be saved from sin. I want to reach my hand up and say yes. I want to take a hold of the hand of Jesus extended to save me. Is that you? Is there anyone else? If you're listening online, there's a place for you to indicate that that's the decision you'd like to make as well. And if that's you, I just want to lead you in a prayer to come and say, God, I want to be in relationship with you. I don't want to be separated from you by my sin, and I'm not too proud to admit that I have sin and that I need to be forgiven. And Jesus, I believe that you, being God, that you came, that you died on the cross for me in my place. And I believe that you rose from the grave, that you give life and life eternal to all who will receive you. And so I ask, would you do that for me today? Please forgive me of my sin. Please give me the gift of a relationship with you starting today and lasting forever. Thank you for forgiving me. And thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you for coming out this weekend. And thank you for uh, staying out for Titans and Tidal Ways. Uh, we're looking forward to jumping into a new series next week. Uh, on your way out, don't forget, if you're new here, we'd love to have you stop by the new here uh, room for the quick connect. Just grab your kids first. Uh, otherwise, have a fantastic Sunday unless you need to have uh, or receive prayer. We'd love to pray for you as well. Blessings, everybody.